A Great Golf Fixed The Parable of the Rich Man and Lazarus Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31 In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Christ shows that in this life men decide their eternal destiny. When the Pharisees, who loved money more than God, heard the teachings of Jesus, they scoffed at him. He responded by telling them this parable. dare you touch me? Do you want me to be unclean as well? <laughs> I shouldn't even allow you to beg at my gate. Forgive me, sir. Forgive me. I have not eaten in days. I wondered if, if I might have some of the scraps that fall from your table. Scraps will fall from my table. <laughs> what then would the dogs eat? I have business to attend to. Here, burn this. It's infected. There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Oh, 
was fulfilled for both men to die and pass from this life to the next. Alms. Welcome. Father Abraham? Yes. Yes, I am Abraham. Welcome to paradise. Paradise? Yes, that is. Paradise! We've been preparing a banquet in your honor. Yes, yes, come. us a great chasm of fixed 
If someone wishes to come from here to you, they cannot, and no one can cross from you to us. Father Abraham, there is one thing I ask of you. Let Lazarus go to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him tell them, warn them, so that they too do not come to this place of torment! They have Moses. They have the prophets. Let your brothers hear them. No. No! But if someone from the dead comes to them, <laughs> they will repent. No, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rises from the dead. Pastor Stephen Moore comments on the parable, The Rich Man and Lazarus. Now, many times Jesus would take the parables that existed in his day and he would turn them upside down and give them a strange twist. This parable of the rich man and Lazarus was not invented by Jesus. It was actually a well-known story that was used by the rabbis. But for the rabbis, the poor man Lazarus was the one who would end up burning in the fires of hell, whereas the rich man, who had enjoyed the blessings of God in this life, would end up in Abraham's bosom. Jesus simply took their common story, he turned it upside down, and he gave it an unexpected twist. Now it's important to realize that this parable was actually told because of the Pharisees. Jesus was actually speaking to the Pharisees in this parable. Notice Luke chapter 16 and verse 14 immediately before the parable we find this statement about the audience that Jesus was speaking to. It says there, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard these things and they derided him. So the special audience that Jesus is speaking to is the Pharisees. Incidentally, this parable is found in the Gospel of Luke. And according to the scholars, Luke was written especially to those of Greek mentality. It was written to the Greeks. And therefore the anthropology of this parable fits very well with the Greek idea of an immortal soul that flies off at the moment of death. Jesus is taking a story that is used in his day and age. He's not saying that the story is true. He's simply speaking to these people in a language that they can understand. Now, I need to say a few things about the Pharisees. Flavius Josephus, who was himself a Pharisee, by the way, he was born in the year 37 AD, told us very clearly what the beliefs of the Pharisees were regarding the nature of man. I read from the book Wars of the Jews uh, this following statement from Josephus. They, that is the Pharisees, say that all souls are incorruptible, but that the souls of good men only are removed into other bodies, but that the souls of bad men are subject to eternal punishment. But the Sadducees take away the belief of the immortal duration of the soul and the punishments and rewards in Hades. In other words, the Sadducees did not believe in the immortality of the soul. They did not believe in the afterlife. The Pharisees believed that all souls are incorruptible. They believed in the immortality of the soul. By the way, the Bible corroborates the view that Josephus is expressing. In Acts chapter 23 and verse 8, Acts 23 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, 
For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So in other words, if Jesus had told this parable to the Sadducees, it wouldn't have made any sense to them. Jesus is using the flame, frame of reference of the Pharisees to get a great truth across. He's using the belief system that they have to teach a great truth which we're going to notice in a little while. Now Ellen White is in harmony with both the book of Acts and Josephus on the issue of whom Jesus was addressing in this parable. In the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 263, we find this statement. In this parable, Christ was meeting the people on their own ground. The doctrine of a conscious state of existence between death and the resurrection was held by many of those who were listening to Christ's words. The Savior knew of their ideas and he framed his parable so as to inculcate important truths through those preconceived opinions. In other words, he took their preconceived ideas and he framed this parable to teach them a great truth within their frame of thinking. Incidentally, even the disciples of Jesus had assimilated this false view that there were ghosts or spirits of the dead hovering over the earth. Notice for example Mark chapter 6 and verse 49. This is when Jesus is walking on the sea and the disciples were frightened and I want you to notice why they were frightened. It says there in Mark 6 verse 49, but when they saw him walking upon the sea they supposed it had been a spirit, in other words a ghost, and cried out. So even the disciples of Jesus had assimilated this idea that the soul of man is immortal, leaves the body at the moment of death, and can come back as an in disincarnated spirit or as a ghost. Now it's interesting to notice uh, the description that Josephus gives about what happened according to the Pharisees when a person died. And I'm going to read as it is described by a scholar the belief system of the Pharisees about what happened immediately at the moment of death. By the way, this is in Josephus' work, Discourse to the Greeks Concerning Hades. Here is the description. In this work, Josephus, Josephus explains that Hades was a subterraneous region which has two compartments. One compartment or region contained a lake of unquenchable everlasting fire and the other was called the bosom of Abraham. So you have this idea of a subterraneous region, it's divided into two parts, the bosom of Abraham, by the way it's on the right side, and the other side is a lake of burning everlasting fire. This scholar continues saying, according to this view when the wicked and the righteous died, they were taken down a descent where there was a gate guarded by an archangel accompanied by a host of angels. At the gate, the wicked were taken by the angels to the compartment which was located on the left side. There was the lake of unquenchable fire where they were to suffer everlasting punishment. The righteous on the other hand, were guided by the angels to the compartment on the right side where the bosom of Abraham was located. Between these two regions there was a great gulf which did not allow the righteous to pass to the region of the wicked or the wicked to the region of the righteous. Now is it obvious that Jesus is picking up on this idea that is being expressed by Josephus in his work Discourse to the Greeks concerning Hades? Obviously yes. Jesus does not believe in this concept. Jesus is simply speaking within their own frame of reference. Now I want you to remember the details uh, of what Josephus says happens to the dead when they die. Uh, because we're going to come back to this in the light of what the New Testament teaches about what occurs to man when man dies. Now the question is, 
Does the Bible really speak about two regions where the dead are retained, uh, one eternally burning in the lake of fire and the other in the bosom of Abraham? The fact is, the Bible does not have anything even close to this idea. During probationary time, the grace of God is offered to every soul. But if men waste their opportunities in self-pleasing, they cut themselves off from everlasting life. By their own choice, they have fixed an impassable gulf between them and their God. This parable draws a contrast between the rich who have not made God their dependence and the poor who have made God their dependence. Those who are poor in this world's goods, yet who trust in God and are patient in suffering, will one day be exalted above those who now hold the highest positions the world can give, but who have not surrendered their life to God. The rich man did not belong to the class represented by the unjust judge, who openly declared his disregard for God and man. He claimed to be a son of Abraham. He did not treat the beggar with violence or require him to go away because the sight of him was disagreeable. If the poor, loathsome specimen of humanity could be comforted by beholding him as he entered his gates, the rich man was willing that he should remain. But he was selfishly indifferent to the needs of his suffering brother. The suffering and needy were brought to the notice of those to whom the Lord had entrusted wealth, that they might receive help and sympathy. Thus it was with the beggar and the rich man. Lazarus was in great need of help, for he was without friends, home, money, or food. Yet he was allowed to remain in this condition day after day, while the wealthy nobleman had every want supplied. The one who was abundantly able to relieve the sufferings of this fellow creature lived to himself as many live today. There are today close beside us many who are hungry, naked, and homeless. A neglect to impart of our means to these needy suffering ones places upon us a burden of guilt which we shall one day fear to meet. The command had been given, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 The rich man was a Jew, and he was acquainted with the command of God. But he forgot that he was accountable for the use of his entrusted means and capabilities. Forgetful of his accountability to God, he devoted all of his powers to pleasure. So engrossed was he in the society of his friends that he lost all sense of his responsibility to cooperate with God in the ministry of mercy. Lazarus represents the suffering poor 
who believe in Christ. The poor man had suffered day by day, but he had patiently and quietly endured. In the course of time he died and was buried. There was no one to mourn for him, but by his patience in sufferings, he had witnessed for Christ. He had endured the test of his faith, and at his death, he is represented as being carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. When the trumpet sounds and all that are in the graves hear Christ's voice and come forth, they will receive their reward, for their faith in God was not a mere theory, but a reality. In this parable, Christ was meeting the people on their own ground. The doctrine of a conscious state of existence between death and the resurrection was held by many of those who were listening to Christ's words. The Savior knew of their ideas, and he framed his parable so as to incalculate important truths through these preconceived opinions. He used the prevailing opinion to convey the idea he wished to make prominent to all, that no man is valued for his possessions, for all he has belongs to him only as lent by the Lord. Christ desires his hearers to understand that it is impossible for men to secure the salvation of the soul after death. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus shows how two classes represented by these men are estimated in the unseen world. A rich man is not condemned for having riches, but condemnation rests upon him if the means entrusted to him is spent in selfishness. Death cannot make any man poor who thus devotes himself to seeking eternal riches. But the man who hoards his treasure for self cannot take any of it to heaven. Christ lifted the curtain and presented this picture before priests and rulers, scribes and Pharisees. Look at it, you who are rich in this world's goods and are not rich towards God. Will you not contemplate this scene? That which is highly esteemed among men is abhorrent in the sight of God. Christ asks, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark chapter 8 verses 36 and 37 Application to the Jewish Nation when Christ gave the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, there were many in the Jewish nation in the pitiful condition of the rich man, using the Lord's goods for selfish gratification, preparing themselves to hear the sentence, Thou art weighted in the balances, and art found wanting. Daniel chapter 5, verse 27. He had given them every spiritual and temporal advantage, and he called upon them to impart these blessings. They were not to seek to gain everything for their own advantage, but were to remember those in need and share with them. But like the rich man, 
they put forth no helping hand to relieve the temporal or spiritual necessities of suffering humanity. Filled with pride, they regarded themselves as the chosen and favored people of God. Yet they did not serve or worship God. They put their dependence in the fact that they were children of Abraham. We be of Abraham's seed, they said proudly. John chapter 8 verse 33. Christ longed to let light shine into the darkened minds of the Jewish people. He said to them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. John chapter 8 verses 39 and 40 The Jews claimed to have descended from Abraham, but by failing to do the works of Abraham, they proved that they were not his true children. Only those who proved themselves to be spiritually in harmony with Abraham by obeying the voice of God are reckoned as true descendants. Christ knew that at the destruction of Jerusalem the Jews would remember his warning. And it was so. When calamity came upon Jerusalem, when starvation and suffering of every kind came upon the people, they remembered these words of Christ and understood the parable. They had brought their suffering upon themselves by their neglect to let their God-given light shine forth to the world. In the last days, the closing scenes of Earth's history are portrayed in the closing of the rich man's history. The rich man claimed to be a son of Abraham, but he was separated from Abraham by an impassable gulf, a character wrongly developed. There are many today who are following the same course, though church members they are unconverted. The soul that longs after the excitement of worldly pleasure, the mind that is full of love for display, cannot serve God. Like the rich man in the parable, such a one has no inclination to war against the lusts of the flesh. He longs to indulge appetite. When the voice of God awakens the dead, he will come from the grave with the same appetites and passions, the same likes and dislikes that he cherished when living. God works no miracles to recreate a man who would not be recreated when he was granted every opportunity and provided with every faculty. His character is not in harmony with God, and he could not be happy in the heavenly family. To learn of Christ means to receive his grace, which is his character. But those who do not appreciate and utilize the precious opportunities and sacred influences granted them on earth are not fitted to take part in the pure devotions of heaven. By their own neglect they have formed a chasm which nothing can bridge. 
between them and the righteous, there is a great gulf fixed. Thank you, and God bless. Christ Object Lessons, pages 108 to 114, Ellen G. White.